Survey research is one of the most common ways that sociologists collect data for their studies. There are a few features of survey research. One of them is that respondents are usually chosen through probability sampling methods in which each respondent has a known chance of selection for participation in the study. Another feature of survey research is that it utilizes systematic questionnaires and interview procedures to ask a set of prescribed questions with preset response categories um, that are asked the same way for every um, participant in the survey. Another thing that differentiates survey research from other methods in sociology is the numeric coding and the statistical analysis of survey responses. So survey response categories can often be numerically coded and then that data can be imported into a program for statistical analysis and researchers can look at relationships between different variables that come from people's responses to surveys. So the numeric coding and analysis is another feature of survey research. So the survey research has three characteristics. Probability sampling methods um, are usually used to select respondents, a large number of respondents. Systematic procedures with a set of questions that have corresponding response categories. And the quantitative analysis of survey data. Today we'll talk about two types of survey research designs. These include cross-sectional designs and longitudinal designs. Cross-sectional designs study a target population at a single point in time. So there are multiple survey interviews completed um, for each person in this, there, that each person is interviewed at one point in time. So in, in this case we have time one and there there's survey interviews completed by person one and person two. And this is diff um, one example of a cross-sectional design is the National Health Interview Survey. The NHIS is a national survey that's conducted by the uh, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, to um, it, it, it utilizes a, a range of questions that um, gather information about American demographic characteristics, their physical and mental health status, and their access to health care. And what makes this a cross-sectional study is that each year um, a, a set of questions are asked of a group of people, but those, but those people are not interviewed in subsequent um, surveys. They're only interviewed at a single point in time. So different people are interviewed each year. In this case, that's what makes it cross-sectional. In contrast, longitudinal designs ask the same questions uh, for each person in the study at two or more points in time. Um, a common longitudinal design is a panel study. Uh, in a panel study, the same respondents are surveyed at two or more times. So in this diagram, you have time one and time two, and pers both person one and person two complete multiple survey interviews at two um, points in time. One example of a panel design is the panel study of income dynamics. Um, the panel study of income dynamics conducted by the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan is a national representative survey of more than 18,000 Americans. Um, and it collects data on employment, income, wealth, expenditures, health, marriage, and a bunch of other topics. But what makes this a panel design is that those um, 18,000 Americans are surveyed at multiple points in time. In addition to panel designs, cohort studies represent another type of longitudinal design. Um, it's lot, they, cohort studies are also longitudinal because the same questions are asked at two or more points in time. But what distinguishes a cohort study from a panel study is that uh, respondents in a cohort study experience the same life event at, um, 
at the start of the survey. So a common cohort study design is maybe to track people who were born in a certain year, whether that's 1970 or 1980. And then those people are followed at multiple points in time throughout their lives. It could also follow people through another event, such as entry into um, uh, middle school or into medical school. Uh, and those people are followed at multiple points in time. One example of a cohort study is the 1970 British cohort study. Um, this, uh, the 1970 British cohort study followed more than 17,000 people who were born in England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and they were born, what makes it a cohort study is that this group of people were born during a single week in 1970. Um, and the study collected information on their health, physical, social development, and economic circumstances at multiple points in time. Another type of longitudinal design um, where the same questions are asked at two or more points in time is a trend study. And um, this is kind of like a blend of cross-sectional and longitudinal study because it's a repeated cross-sectional study of the same items or variables. So the same survey questions are asked at multiple points in time, but the people who are responding to those questions are different. So that what this allows you to do is it allows you to see if people are responding, have certain attitudes or beliefs, um, and how those attitudes and beliefs change over historical periods. Um, an example of a trend design is the general social survey, which is one of the most popular surveys for sociological analysis. And the, what makes the GSS a trend design is that they have a standard core uh, questionnaire that's asked every year. And this standardized core includes demographic, behavioral, and attitudinal questions, including those about civil liberties, crime and violence, morality and well-being, social mobility, even things like stress and traumatic events. And by asking these same questions repeatedly year after year, researchers can look at tra uh, trends um, going back to 1972 up until uh, the current day. So when you're planning a research study, there's a few things to take into account. Um, just like any research study, you have to sort of select a topic and formulate your research question in um, in researchable terms. You have to you have to sort of take a problem and, and format it into researchable terms. And and one way to sort of help plan a survey research study is to begin by reviewing the scientific literature. And you don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel with your survey questionnaire. So you want to see if there are existing measures or scales that other researchers have used that you could incorporate into your own survey questionnaire um, and use for analysis in your own study. Um, a big So once you've selected and refined your problem, you've reviewed the literature, the next step is to sort of figure out how you're going to select respondents um, to develop a sampling plan and also finalize your survey instrument. You have to detail the interview schedule, all the skip patterns, all the questions that you're asking, making sure you're capturing all of the key variables in your study. And finally, you have to decide on a mode of asking survey questions. Survey questions can be asked face-to-face, -face, um, over the telephone, or even through web surveys and other online formats. And now we're going to talk about some of the different modes um, that surveys can be administered. Um, there are several sources of error in survey research. There can be coverage error, where there are differences between the population that you want to study and the people that you actually sampled. If the people that you actually sampled are different from your target population, there could be a source of error in your survey study, um, and that, that's referred to as coverage error. Sampling error refers to differences between the population values, so the, the value of some characteristic in the, in the actual population, and the estimate that you come to in your um, survey sample. That's referred to as sampling error. Non-response error occurs when there are differences between the people who respond to your survey and those who don't. If people who respond to your survey are fundamentally different than those who do not respond to your survey, um, you'll have significant non-response error in your survey estimates. 
And finally, another source of another common source of error in survey research is error that's due to inaccurate responses um, to your survey questions due to um, things that the interviewer, the survey interviewer is doing, or faulty questions that are gathering bad data. So if there's problems with the survey instrument itself, that could lead to measurement error. Or if the interviewer is not following the script, the survey schedule, they, that could also lead to measurement error. There are several modes of survey administration, including face-to-face -face interviews, telephone interviews, computer-assisted self-interviews like web surveys and questionnaires that people complete by sitting down at a computer, and just good old-fashioned um, paper and pencil questionnaires that people might complete in a group setting such as a classroom or a work um, meeting. Face-to-face -face interviews or in-person interviews are kind of the gold standard for survey interviews. Um, and they're the gold standard because they rely on trained interviewers, people who are familiar with the survey questions, the responses, how to ask people those questions. They face-to-face -face interviews tend to have the highest response rates of any of the survey mechanisms. Um, and the response rate for a survey refers to the percentage of sampled persons that actually complete the survey. For face-to-face -face interviews, response rates can be up to 70 or 80 percent, um, which is a lot higher than other modes of survey administration. Face-to-face -face interviews are also appropriate when the survey questionnaire is fairly long. If you have a long survey instrument that takes several hours, face-to-face um, -face interviews might be your best bet. Face-to-face -face interviews also allow the survey interviewer to observe the social setting in which the respondent lives, things about their neighborhood or household, and they can record this information on the survey questionnaire and use it as additional data in the study. Despite these advantages of face-to-face -face interviews, they have several disadvantages, including higher costs um, because interviewers have to be recruited and trained and supervised um, and this adds significant cost to the study. And it also, interviewers can introduce bias by failing to follow the interview schedule. If they don't ask the prescribed set of questions or offer the set of responses to those questions that the interview schedule outlines, that can introduce um, measurement error to the study. And so this is a potential disadvantage of face-to-face -face interviews. Telephone interviews are another common method of gathering survey data. They include, um, they also use trained interviewers who are familiar with the survey questions, just like face-to-face -face interviewers. Um, but telephone interviews tend to actually have faster completion time, and, and they offer substantial savings relative to face-to-face -face surveys. However, telephone interviews tend to have lower response rates um, compared to face-to-face -face interviews. Um, you know, roughly response rates between 20 and 50 percent, usually around 30 percent um, response rates for telephone interviews. However, unlike face-to-face -face interviews, telephone interviews are are mainly appropriate for shorter surveys. They're not they're not great for surveys that are longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that it's difficult for the survey interviewers to establish trust and rapport with people over the telephone. Um, whereas in face to face, there's there can be a face to face interviews. There can be more of a personal connection that allows the interviewer to establish trust and rapport. One of the most um, fast, the fastest growing type of survey is the computer assisted self interview. Um, this uh, this type of survey, which includes web surveys, has been rapidly adopted by researchers, and it will eventually replace um, face to face and phone surveys in the future. Computer-assisted self-interviews tend to be lower cost um, because they don't require trained interviewers to administer the survey. Um, doesn't require that personnel time and supervision. They tend to be administered fairly quickly. Um, it offers a lot of flexibility in the questionnaire design. The researchers can use complicated experimental designs and skip patterns. Um, that can be difficult for a trained interview to sort of master, um, but web surveys can accomplish this fairly easily. Despite all of these advantages, 
computer-assisted self-interviews like web surveys um, that are administered on platforms like SurveyGizmo or SurveyMonkey, they tend to have fairly low response rates um, compared to telephone and face-to-face -face, um, modes of survey administration. It's not uncommon for a web survey to have a 10% or lower response rate. Um, depending on the familiarity of the researcher to their respondents, they can be as high as 50%. In my experience, though, it's, it's, it's challenging to get response rates above um, 20 or 30% for a, um, a web survey, and it's not uncommon for a web survey to have a 10% response rate.